Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Cornerstone Baptist Church Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. As you might guess, I am not Dr. Rick Bird. I am Jim Grasty. I'm pastor of senior adults here at Cornerstone. And uh, Pastor Bird asked me to fill in for him for a few weeks. And uh, so we're going to start tonight with some prayer. And then when I get into the message, if you want to get your Bibles and turn to the little book of Haggai in the back in the Old Testament, it's right before Zechariah. So it's next to the, let's see, you got Haggai, you got Zechariah, and then you've got Malachi. So it's the third book from the last book in the Old Testament, right before you get to Matthew. Haggai, just two little chapters. We'll spend three weeks looking at, at uh, the little book of Haggai. So but we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, so if you got some prayer requests in your heart, we will cover and think about unspoken requests. And at that time, you can voice your own request to the Lord. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so glad to be able to be here today. And we're thankful, Father, during this time of COVID-19 to have technology like uh, video and Zoom and, and um, YouTube by which we can access and make contact with communicators of God's Word and with one another. And Heavenly Father, as we come together tonight, this afternoon, to bring our request to you, first thing we want to do, though, Father, is acknowledge that you are God and we are your children. And we've come to know you through a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we come to pray because we know that we are a needy people. And we come to pray because we have problems and our children have problems and our families and their needs and weaknesses and their financial issues and relationship problems and physical illnesses, Father, surgeries to be faced, surgeries to be recovered from, surgeries to be avoided. It's all kinds of needs, Heavenly Father, that drives us to our knees and drives us to the throne of grace, which, of course, Lord, is a throne, a throne of power and authority, a throne, Father, upon which who sits the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom you've given all power and authority, he told us. And so, Lord, we come to you to this afternoon and we bring to you our needs as individuals and as families to bring you, Lord, our needs as a church. And, Father, even outside the walls of Cornerstone Baptist Church, we would want to include in our prayer tonight the needs of all of God's people. And so, Father, as we Think about the issues that are upon our hearts, the needs, the problems, the difficulties, things, Lord, that are beyond our ability to control, beyond our ability to change. We have to come to you. And we ask you, Heavenly Father, to work in the lives, in the families of each one of whom we're thinking and for whom we're praying. We thank you, Father, that we also want to come and, and give you thanksgiving. We want to thank you for answered prayer in the past, even last week, even yesterday. We want to thank you, Father, that you, you are a prayer-answering God. That's what motivates us, Lord, to keep coming back to pray time and time again, because we can look and we see where you've answered in the past, because you do answer prayer. You've promised, you have the power, you have the compassion, you have the love that moves you and motivates you to listen to our prayers and to answer them. So we want to thank you tonight, Lord, for how good you've been to us. We want to thank you for your grace, for your kindness. We want to thank you for our church. We pray for our senior pastor tonight. We pray for the other pastoral staff members here at Cornerstone. We want to remember, Father, all of the lay ministry leaders here at Cornerstone. There's a host of individuals, Lord, an army of people, men and women, who minister here at Cornerstone Baptist Church and tend to the needs of our congregation. We thank you, Father, that the majority and the, uh, the largest part of activity 
here at Cornerstone goes out goes on outside our worship times. In fact, our worship hours, Lord, at 9 and 11 on Sunday mornings, it's really the smallest part of what goes on at Cornerstone because there's so much activity outside these walls seven days a week. And we're so grateful, Father, that this is a place of ministry, a place, Father, where people can come and feel safe and accepted and loved, where they don't feel judged and rejected and criticized and ridiculed. They can come to Cornerstone, Father, uh, free from the sins of their past because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because we believe in the grace of God. We believe in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. We believe, Lord, as our pastor preaches so faithfully, that we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And Lord, there's nothing to be added to that. We're so grateful. We're so thankful, Father. We also serve a Savior. We worship a Lord, Lord, who's coming back one day. We're looking forward to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we have an election that's looming on the horizon in just a couple of short weeks. But Father, no matter how that turns out, it won't change the fact that Jesus Christ rules and reigns. It won't change the fact that we look for a city whose builder and maker is God. It won't change the fact that we are sojourners and pilgrims in this world and our citizenship is in heaven. And we're looking forward, Father, to your work, your plan, your sovereign, redemptive program that you're working out in this planet, on this planet, in this world. So our confidence, our faith, our trust is in you. We get our joy from our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We get our hope and our encouragement, our confidence, Lord, from the Word of God that tells us that Jesus Christ rules and reigns in the kingdom of men. And we're looking forward to that day when the kingdom of God comes to earth. So, Father, we pray for our world. We pray for our country. We pray for our town, our state. Pray for those in authority over us. We pray for our church family. Pray for individual families. Pray for moms and dads and teenagers and children. And Lord, we're just thankful tonight that we can come and we can pray. And so, Father, we cast our cares upon you because you care for us, your scripture says. And we cast our burdens upon you because the scripture tells us you will sustain us. Thank you, Father, that we can trust you, live for you, stand tall for you. Now, Lord, as we come to the close of our prayer, we want, Lord, to turn our focus and our attention toward the wonderful, inspired, inerrant, powerful Word of God. And that, Heavenly Father, you would speak to our hearts tonight through the scriptures. Give me utterance and speak to my heart and through me. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and for his sake. Amen. All right, I'm excited about uh, this little book of Haggai. It's a small book, only two chapters. You have, uh, let's see, we have uh, 20, no, we have 15 verses in the first chapter. And we have 23 verses in the second chapter. So it is a small book, but it's a powerful book. It's a good book. Let's get some uh, a little background, though, because you can understand what Haggai is about. You've got to understand what's going on or what's been going on in Israel. So put your uh, thinking caps on and we're going to go t back in time and we're going to consider the history of Israel as it led up to where Haggai is in our history book here in the Old Testament. You remember the Jews. They had a bad habit of getting involved with idolatry. Throughout their history, they couldn't seem to get right that there was one God, the Lord, uh, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, one God, and they were to worship that one God. 
And there was the temple in Jerusalem where he put his name. There was the altar where you would make your sacrifices for atonement for your sin. There was a priesthood that would come and, and they would explain the word of God. And you would pray and you would fellowship and you would worship God there in Jerusalem. But they had a bad habit of getting involved with fake gods, false gods of the, of the Canaanites in the surrounding area. And so God kept sending prophets to them, warning them, if you keep this up, judgment's going to come. And they kept ignoring the prophets. Now, there was a few revivals. There was a few good kings who, who got it and tried to do reform, tried to bring the people back to the worship of the one true God. But there were more evil kings than there were good kings. And many of those prophets that God sent were ignored. Some were stoned, some were killed, some were thrown in prison, or in Jeremiah's case, thrown in a dung hill, a dung pit. But the Word of God was repudiated, resisted, neglected, ignored through all those years. And finally, during the time of Isaiah, God, who's always true to His Word, sent the Babylonians. And they came down, and you know the story. They came into Jerusalem, and they kidnapped most of the population and took them all the way over to Babylon, about a thousand miles away, give or take. They took doctors and lawyers and educators and philosophers and, and all kinds of educated people. Some of the farmers and some of the, the, the blue-collar folks of that day, they left in Jerusalem and in Israel. And they took the creme de la creme of the, of the, of the population to Babylon where they spent 70 long years, seven decades. And while they were there, God sent them some prophets like Ezekiel who was there. And the Babylonians came into Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple. They stole the gold, they stole the silver. They went to the walls of Jerusalem, they knocked them down. They burned them. They burned the temple, left the whole city a pile of rock in ruin. And Ezekiel tells us how right before the Babylonians came and destroyed the temple, how the Spirit of God, the glory of God, departed from the temple point by point, face by face, stage by stage, until he hovered over the temple and then he went up. And the glory of God departed. Well, now throw yourself 70 years into the future and you have a new king. Babylon is gone. There's a new nation called Medo-Persia and a new king named Cyrus. And one day, under the leadership of God, God working in his heart, he said, hey, how about you Jews go back to Jerusalem? Really? Yeah, go back to Jerusalem. You can rebuild the city. Well, those that were alive 70 years earlier, say if you were 15 years old when, when they went off to Babylon, now you're 85 years old. Or if you're 10 years old, now you're 80 years old. But most of those folks had been born in Babylon. They had never been to Jerusalem. They had heard the stories. And so thousands came back. And they came into the city, and what did they find? They found the walls broken down. They found the temple burned with fire. But God gave them a charge. I want you to rebuild the temple. I want you to rebuild it because for 70 years, it's been 70, there's been no place to worship God. No place for fellowship with God. No place to make the sacrifices. No places for the heave offering and the wave offering and the burnt offering. No place to come and to pray and to worship and hear God's word expounded. No place for singing the songs of Zion. No place for the worship of the one true God. Now we're going to come back and rebuild the temple. And rebuild the city walls. So they did. And you can, come, you can go all the way back and you can look at the, the little book of, uh, of, uh, of Ezra. And it'll tell you all about how they came back. But something happened. Not everybody thought it was a great idea. 
to come and rebuild the temple. There were lots of people in the land who weren't Jews. They weren't worshipers of Jehovah, the one true God. They were Canaanites. They were still worshiping the false gods. And they didn't want the Israelites coming back. And so they got together and they started a protest against the Jews rebuilding the temple. And they even got another came out of Turkses who came and, and they wrote, wrote a letter stopping them from doing it. Now God had sent Ezra there to rebuild the temple. He sent Nehemiah there to rebuild the walls of the city. But there was opposition. And so the people who were so excited, now they were discouraged. Now they were disappointed. And they quit. And for 16 years, the work of rebuilding the temple stopped. For 16 years, they walk up and down and they pass the temple ruins. For 16 years, day after day. But the Bible tells us, well, they wouldn't build the house of God. But you know what they did do? They built their own houses. Everyone went and built their own houses, sowed their own fields, raised their own barns. They got on with their own lives. They left the house of God lying dormant and in ruins. And that's what brings us to Haggai. That's the background. Because the people who had gone there with such excitement and such flair and such anticipation, suddenly they were discouraged and distraught. And they quit and they gave up. You see, these people who came from Babylon to come back and rebuild the great kingdom of Israel, now they were disappointed. And in their disappointment with God, they actually disappointed God. And tonight and next Wednesday and the Wednesday after that, we want to look at several principles on how to overcome disappointing God. You say, well, Jim, I would much rather hear about how to overcome my disappointment. Your disappointment is not the issue. In fact, Haggai was not speaking to the disappointment of the people. He was speaking to them about the disappointment God was having with the people. Let me give you a little clue. If God is not disappointed with me, chances are I won't be disappointed with Him. Sometimes we get the cart before the horse, don't we? We think, Lord, if I'm happy, if all my dreams come true, if all my eggs are in a row, everything is right in my life, then, Lord, I'll be able to serve you. No, that's not how it often goes. Let's start reading in chapter 1 of Haggai, verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panel houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Sixteen years. The temple lay dormant. Sixteen years the people built their own houses, restarted their own lives, and left the worship of God, the fellowship with God, the service of God, they neglected it. Because they were discouraged over the opposition they received. And so God sends them a prophet and Haggai 
quotes the Lord as saying in verse 2, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people, that is the Jews, these people who have come back, this is what they say. The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Here's the first principle. Now listen to it. Write it down. Discouragement is not discharge from duty. Let me say it again. Discouragement is not discharge from duty. Just because they were discouraged, just because there was opposition, did not mean they should quit building the house of the Lord. Just because there was trouble and difficulty did not mean that God was saying, okay, man, I didn't see that coming. I, I didn't know when I sent you back from Babylon back here to rebuild the temple. Oh, wow, that really caught me by surprise. I didn't know that these Gentiles, Canaanites, were going to oppose you. That kind of took me by surprise. Did God say that? Of course not. He didn't take God by surprise. He knew when he sent them back, they'd have opposition. He knew they'd be get discouraged. But discouragement is not discharged from our duty. When we're discouraged, it's not a call to quit. It's a call to buckle down. It's a call to pray. It's a call to trust. It's a call to unite. Discouragement is a, is a call to overcome. Discouragement is never to be appeased. It's to be conquered. Later on, in fact, we won't take time to look at it in this series, but you can read in Nehemiah, he had opposition to rebuild the walls. Did he quit? No, he, he got out there and each man on the wall had a shovel in one hand and a spear in the other. Yeah, they were going to overcome their discouragement. You try to stop me from building this temple, you're going to get this spear. They overcame it. Discouragement is never discharged from duty. It is a call to unite with others. It is a call to pray, a call to trust. It's a call to, to scheme, to, to think of how we can overcome the opposition because we've got to get God's house built. That was the most important thing. That was the priority, getting the temple built, getting the altar rebuilt that they might make the right sacrifices, that they might come and, and get right with God and pray and meet with Him, that His name might be, that His Spirit might come back and fill it. Discouragement is never a discharge from duty. Second principle, notice what he says. Here's what they're saying. The people says, in verse 2, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. This comes right out of the first one. Procrastination in obedience is rebellion against God. The interesting thing is this. It's not that they were saying, we're never going to build the Lord's house. That's not they were, what they were saying is, it's not time to build the Lord's house. It's not the right time. But God says, well, it's the right time to build your own panel houses. Verse 4, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Why is it the right time to build your house, but it's not the right time to build my house? You are procrastinating in obedience. And that's rebellion. But they said, well, it's not that we're not going to do it. We're just not going to do it now. We're going to do that, but not yet. Kind of like we say, well, Lord, uh, I'm going to start tithing, but I better wait till I get that promotion. Lord, I, I'm going to start um, treating my wife better, but only after she starts treating me better. Well, Lord, I'm going to start doing this once this happens. It's just not the right time. I'll wait to New Year's, Lord. Uh, yeah, I'll start going to Sunday school or teaching Sunday school in New Year's. That's when I make my resolutions. It's just not the right time. I'm going to do it, but not yet. Not yet. Procrastination is rebellion against God. They procrastinated for 16 years. 
No one wanted to pick up the shovel, pick up the tools to rebuild the Lord's house. How are you going to overcome disappointing God if we keep giving in to our discouragements and we keep procrastinating in those things that we know He's spoken to us about. What has God spoken to you about? What is it that God has been speaking to you maybe for years? And you keep saying, Lord, I'm going to do it. But not yet. But not yet. The third principle well, comes right out of the second we just looked at. They asked a question in verse 4. Is it time? Actually, in verse 2, the people says, The time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Listen, it's always the right time to do the right thing. It's always the right time to obey the Lord. It's all, if you know something that God wants you to do, it's always the right time to obey. Never procrastinate. Never put it off. Never put off till tomorrow what God wants you to do today. He gives you the strength. He gives you the power. He gives you His assurance. He gives you His presence. What more would you need? It's always the right time to obey God. And then lastly, notice this. Start reading in, uh, we're going to start in verse 4 down through verse 6. God asked, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panel houses? And this temple that is my house to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways, or ponder your heart, examine your heart, he's saying this. You have sown much and bring in little. In other words, you've gone out there and you have sown hundreds of acres, but you brought in very little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. You see, all these people who were letting the house of God lie in ruins and did not obey Him, procrastinated, gave in to the discouragement. They built their own houses and they sowed, but they didn't have enough. They experienced futility and disappointment and failure and shame and lack and want. They had their panel houses, but God's house laid in ruins. The last principle for tonight is this. In order to get over disappointing God, never give priority to that which perishes while neglecting that which is eternal. Never give priority to that which perishes while neglecting that which is eternal. Is these people who had given in to the discouragement, who capitulated to the opposition, who had just surrendered to God's enemies, who had given in to discouragement, who had procrastinated in obedience, Never thought it was the right time to obey God. They gave priority to all the physical, to all the material. God didn't simply say in verse 4, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your houses? No, He said your paneled houses. You've lived in your paneled houses. Special houses. I mean, these were not huts. These were paneled houses, very luxurious type houses they had lived in. They had really gone all out. We would say today, I mean, four bedrooms, three baths, and a three-car garage, and a pool in the backyard, and a picket fence. They had it all. But my house lies in ruins. And the important eternal spiritual work of worshiping God, praying to God, fellowshiping with God, sacrificing to God, 
teaching the Word of God, experiencing the illumination of the Holy Spirit, fellowship of God's people there, growing in the knowledge of the one true God. All of those things for 16 years lay dormant. Never give priority to that which perishes while neglecting that which is eternal. I don't know about you, but I've had times in my life when I've disappointed the Lord. If we're honest, I think we can all say we've all had those times. But I can tell you, there's no joy. There's no heart satisfaction. There's no peace. There's no gratification. There's no satisfaction. There's nothing this earth can buy that equals the joy and the peace that is yours when you know that you've not disappointed God. You see, a preacher is something like you're talking about sin. Yes, disappointing God is sin. Sin disappoints him. It grieves his spirit. It quenches his spirit. If, that does, if that's not disappointment, I don't know what is. But these are some things that we can learn from the people of, of God there in Jerusalem back in, in the Old Testament time. Things they needed to learn so they would not disappoint God. I'm going to repeat this one more time we'll close. Discouragement is never discharged from duty. Procrastination and obedience is rebellion against God. It is always right, always the right time to obey God. Never give priority to that which perishes while neglecting that which is eternal. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your precious word. The scripture tells us, Lord, in the New Testament, that these things in the old were written for our example and for our learning. And you've given us these Old, story, these old Testament historical accounts that we might learn from the example of the people of God. Sometimes from positive examples they gave and sometimes from negative negative. and Lord we here in the New Testament economy we don't have to rebuild temples we don't have to rebuild city walls but Lord sometimes we have to rebuild our lives sometimes we have to rebuild our ministries sometimes we have to rebuild relationships we have to rebuild trust we have to rebuild feelings for one another and for others. We have to rebuild our relationship with you. And so, Father, these principles we can learn because I'm sure I'm speaking to most people who would say, I don't want to disappoint God. I don't want to disappoint the Lord who loved me. The Lord who died on the cross for me and rose again from the dead. I don't want to disappoint him. Lord, help us to learn from your word that we won't do that. Make us sensitive, Lord, of those things in our lives. And we'll see next week exactly what he meant by pondering your ways, considering your ways. What a principle that is. Thank you for your word, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night. The Lord bless you.